Great, so we have uh, our last talk will be uh, an hour long talk from Ahmed El Alawi, El Alawi uh, uh, just down the road at Stanford. Thanks, Thank you very Ahmed. much, Ryan, and thank you for uh, the organization and for inviting me to give this talk. As I said, so my bandwidth is uh, somewhat limited, so I'll cut my video and hopefully uh, don't feel offended if I do that. <laughs> um, okay, so. I'll be talking about uh, incremental approximate message passing, and this is after some work of Andrea Montanari that was uh, published in 2018, and then the follow-up work of myself, Andrea, and Mark Selke uh, two, years, two, two years later. So here, um, and by the way, please let me know if you have any questions or anything. I'll try to go slow, so that's why I chose to do this uh, on an iPad. So the question here, the general question is to try to optimize uh, random functions on, let's say, the hypercube plus minus one to the power. Mm, we do not actually see your screen updating. I assume from the clicking you're writing. Uh, let's see. So, yes. Um, so far, I, okay. I only see the title and uh, the subheading. I see your mouse cursor moving around, though. Uh, so, there maybe there is a problem in the connection of my iPad with my. So sometimes just if you're using notability, just getting out and in works. Ah, uh, let's try this again. Nope. Doesn't show up still. We don't okay. see anything new besides the so title. This is, this is embarrassing. Let's see. I'm going to pause the sharing. I'm going to do it again. Okay. Uh, Nothing still? Okay, this is weird. Uh, let's see, how do I stop sharing? Stop share, share again. Okay, so my technology is really failing me. Um, I apologize for this. No worries. Right, so my iPad cannot connect, it doesn't want to connect at all. Hmm. Ahmed, is there a program that you can use on your desktop uh, that you're currently <laughs> using? I do have I do have slides, so as a, as a last resort, I'll just uh, just abandon trying to do this on iPad and do slides. But uh, okay. Are you connecting via AirPlay or what? Yeah, I'm trying to do AirPlay, right? Yeah, it's just not finding it for some reason. Okay, let's try again.
Yeah, I think I'm gonna do slides. Um, let me try to find my slides now. Um, yeah, apologies. Let's see. Please go take a break and uh, get coffee. Uh, this will take a couple of minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Something should work now. Do you see my slides? Yes, we see your slides. Yes. Great. Okay. So I apologize for this, but so, all right. Um, so this will be a, this will be a talk about optimization in midfield spin glasses. So uh, this is joint work with Andrea Montanari and Mark, Mark Silky. And uh, so don't pay attention to this. Uh, this was not intended. These slides were not intended to be presented in this workshop, but it will do the work. Um, right. So uh, the objective here is to try to optimize highly non-convex and combinatorial functions in polynomial time. And the second related question is that of sampling from high dimensional distributions. And uh, is that possible in general? And so there are numerous applications in all computationally oriented fields, of course, and we've heard uh, very related questions uh, about this uh, in previous talks in this morning. And uh, the idea here is to study a simple model from theoretical physics, which exhibits a very uh, rich structure and try to exploit that structure, hopefully, in order to uh, uh, design algorithms. Okay, so, so the, the first part of the talk is to actually define these functions. And uh, so generally, these will be what are called the easy mixed, spin, mix, mixed P spins Hamiltonians. And in general, so we define them as being a uh, centered. So we have HN being the Hamiltonian or the function that we're trying to optimize. It's defined over the hypercube sigma n. And it's a centered Gaussian process with covariance that is when you evaluate it at two points sigma and sigma prime is just a function of the inner products between these two functions at uh, these two points, right? And the covariance is completely characterized by uh, this uh, function sigma or C. And uh, so we can write it explicitly. So either we can do a definition of this form, this H is a centered Gaussian process with this covariance, or we can write it explicitly pointwise. And this is the expression for it. So WP is a tensor, a symmetric Gaussian tensor that is of order P. And sigma P is just the rank one P order tensor of sigma. And this is just the inner product between tensors, right? And uh, so the relationship between the function C and the coefficient CP is that C is the, just the generating function of these coefficients. Okay. Um, two examples to keep in mind are the two spin or the Sherrington Kirkpatrick Hamiltonian, which is just a quadratic here. So this is just depends on product sigma i, sigma j, and these coefficients are Gaussian and random. And uh, C in this case is just x squared. And the second example I want you to keep in mind is the three spin model, which is almost the same thing, but here we have polynomials of degree three. Okay, and these are still Gaussian. Uh, G, I, J, K are still Gaussian, okay? And now, so the question here would be to uh, maximize uh, this, this function, this random function over the hypercube. So this is called the ground state as a jargon. Okay. Um, so how can we efficiently find an approximate ground state? But so first I have to tell you what is the model, the computational model that I have that, I, that I'm considering here. 
I'm considering a model in which uh, there is an oracle that gives me gradients. So either if you're in the two spin case, if you're in the Sherrington Kirkpatrick case, you don't have to think too much about this. I just give you the random matrix of interactions and I ask you to uh, produce a, a good solution. But in general, you need a description, a concise description of this HN because it's a general function. And in particular, I'll just uh, consider that an oracle gives me gradients at any point I want, okay? And I have a tolerance epsilon and I want to uh, generate a vector sigma alg that depends on all the queries that I get from the, from the oracle. And for which I have a one minus epsilon multiplicative approximation to the maximum with high probability. And I want the number of queries to be polynomial in N and one over epsilon. Okay. Okay, so in general, if I don't assume anything, then this problem is already NP hard. If you don't, I don't assume that my function H is random. This is already for quadratic, it's NP hard. And it's NP hard already for very bad approximation ratios. If one minus epsilon is already of order one over log N to some power, this is uh, impossible. This is not feasible. And um, okay, so one can consider, for instance, convex relaxations in the general, in the, in the non in the average case, you can consider convex relaxation. So for instance, let's consider the quadratic case, which is the case k equal two. So this is just the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And uh, I try to compute this maximum. This maximum will be of order 1.52. This is, uh, I'll talk about this a bit later, but this is called the Parisi formula. And so one can do a spectral relaxation. So we talked about relaxations in this morning. And for this particular problem, if you just compute the spectral relaxation, which is uh, just relaxes the sphere or relaxes the hypercube by the sphere of the same radius, then this will be just the first eigenvalue of this matrix G, which is two, right? So it misses by a constant factor, the optimal value. And um, okay, so the next one is the SDV relaxations, which has been discussed this morning. I just put this sigma to the other sides and so I have G times sigma sigma transpose and I replace sigma sigma transpose by a PSD matrix that is N by N and has diagonal B in the identity. So one, one's on the diagonal. It turns out that this doesn't improve and we've discussed this this morning. And so it turns out, so now you can consider the general hierarchy of SDP relaxations of SOS relaxations. It turns out that degree four SOS doesn't do any better than this uh, number two, it still gives you the, the same value. And there is strong evidence that, uh, that uh, the, this is the spectral bound, this number two is the best computationally possible for certification of for refutation. So here I'm considering convex relaxations that are by definition will always give you a upper bound, whether G is uh, random or not, but you want for G being random or coming from the GOE to be the closest possible. So this is called certification. Turns out that this problem is quite hard or is believed to be quite hard and the spectral bound is the best possible uh, uh, conjecturally. Okay, so further approaches, uh, you can consider now the spherical case. So let's relax this uh, Boolean uh, constraint, so there's plus minus one constraint and just consider the spherical case. But now let's consider a homogeneous, homogeneous uh, degree k polynomial, so which is called the pure k spin spherical model. And you can consider also the SOS hierarchy at level k. So you match the degree of the polynomial in your hierarchy. And it turns out this is not only greater than the optimum, but it's greater than the optimum by a diverging factor, which is polynomial in n. So this is like when you start to consider higher order polynomials, this doesn't do any better. It gets strictly worse. So other approaches that you can consider are global dynamics. So let's move away from convex relaxations and let's consider, for instance, other, other, other approaches. And here, for instance, you can do uh, Langevin global dynamics. There is a rich literature, but we know that at, at least at uh, low temperature, uh, there is little dynamics are slow and the mixing is exponential. And typically in uh, polynomial time, you'll only get stuck in what's called the threshold energy. So this is an energy that is, yeah. I, I, Ahmed, sorry. Um, this better pro Goswami, Goswami Lee. Yeah. The left hand side of that inequality is the bound on the Hamiltonian achieved by any constant level of SOS. That's what that means. So this is uh, SOS at level K, right? This K is level ah. K. Yeah. So I'm so, just matching, I'm considering the same level as the degree of the polynomial I'm considering and trying to optimize. Ah, uh, but so this is getting worse 
with K relative to the optimum yeah. because you're increasing, you're simultaneously increasing <clears throat> the arity of the model as well as the, uh, okay. So you can consider K fixed and uh, just let N go to infinity, then you'll see that's already in N it gets bad, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I'm just wondering what's known about if we hold the arity of the model fixed while increasing the degree of SOS. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure this, I, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure if this has been analyzed, but I might, I might, I don't know the literature so well in this, in this field. Maybe that has been done has, since right. 2016. I mean, yeah. Just yeah. Slail, do you know? Well, so this, uh, this <clears throat> Krueger Swami Lee paper contains a bound and also um, the joint work of Prasad, Rita Vendra, and Sikisha and myself as an upper bound. But you don't get, I mean, for constant level SOS, you don't get any improvement over this. I see. Oh. There, there's also at least a, a proof sketch, or some would call it a proof, of a matching lower bound for the case of degree three lower bounds, uh, degree three SO, degree three polynomials, uh, high degree SOS, like degree uh, n to the 0 0.01. Um, in a paper from Fox 17. I see. Well, thank you guys for the, for the hopefully that's, that answers Chris's question. Um, all right, let's continue here. So, so the type of algorithms I'm, I will try to discuss today are what I call dual algorithms and that will show up in a second, will be clear in a second. So there's a very nice paper by Renan Subag that considers the spherical model. So consider all P spins or mixed P spins for when you're not considering optimizing over the hypercube, but over the sphere of the same radius. And he has this iterative algorithm that, that is based on this idea of, of orthogonal updates that tries to find an optimum and it indeed tries to succeed at getting an approximate uh, optimizer that is one minus epsilon optimal for any epsilon positive. And the algorithm runs in polynomial time. And Andrea afterwards uh, tried to extend this idea to the easing case for the SK model. And uh, the same result holds. And these, both of these results hold under a certain condition that is called the no overlap gap assumption. Um, so under this no overlap gap, you can get optima, uh, approximate optima for any epsilon. But on the other side, uh, there is a very nice line of work by Gomarnik and his co-authors in many papers that show impossibility results if there is overlap gap. So if the problem has overlap gap, then there is a large class of algorithms that have pro provably failed in this, uh, in, in this other, for this type of questions. Okay, so let me tell you about um, uh, what we can do about this problem. So I have to tell you what the Parisi formula is. So that, what, that the Parisi formula characterizes the maximum value that is achieved uh, for this uh, particular optimization problem. And I need to introduce it to you. So let u be the set of functions that are go from the interval 0, 1 to the positive reals. They are non-decreasing and they're L1. OK? So now take a function from, uh, from this class and put it here in this PDE. This is a nonlinear PDE that you can solve backwards from this terminal condition. And now solve this PDE and consider this functional P of gamma that takes the value at 0, 0, and then subtracts a linear term in gamma. So this is a functional over this class u. And now the result is that the normalized maximum over uh, the hypercube of this random function h converges to the infimum of p over this class u. OK, so this is called the Parisi formula at zero temperature. And uh, so the first thing, so OK, so this seems to come out of nowhere first. The second thing is that the maximum flipped into an infimum. So how did that happen? We didn't change signs or anything here in an obvious way. So how did the maximum flip into an infimum? And the question, another question is how this, did this discrete uh, problem converge to something that is so complicated that is, has to be written in terms of a PDE, nonlinear PDE and an infimum over, over a class of functions. It's a variational problem over a class of functions. So, okay, so let me describe just a rough picture of the landscape here. So if you consider the super level sets of the Hamiltonian, 
uh, that are uh, one minus epsilon above the or times the that times the optimum and consider sampling two points from the uniform distribution over the set. So that so now we consider the inner products, the normalized inner products between these two uh, configurations. It turns out that that will converge to a non-degenerate random variable. So this random variable will not concentrate, and it turns out that we'll have a full distribution that has a certain support that is non-trivial. And this is in very sharp contrast, contrast with convex functions. So indeed, if you have a convex fun function and you uh, consider the level set or the super level set at any level epsilon, that will be a convex set. The uniform measure over a convex set will be log concave, therefore it will enjoy a certain amount of concentration. And this inner product will indeed concentrate for a convex function. So this is very much the opposite of a convex function. So pictorially, you can see something that looks like this. Ahmed, can I jump in with a quick clarifying question? Yeah, please. So is this the convergence? Is this uh, conjectural or it's, I'm just trying to understand what state of the art is in. Uh, right. So for certain models, uh, for certain, there, there are certain technical conditions under which you can show that this thing converges to, uh, to uh, well, so I talked about this Parisi formula and gamma has a probabilistic interpretation in that gamma, at least at positive temperature, gamma is actually the cumulative distribution function of this random variable, or at least that's the physical intuition or interpretation of gamma. And, uh, and under certain technical conditions, you can show that indeed this, uh, this random variable will have a distribution that converges to gamma, but I don't remember exactly the technical conditions. I think that's generic generic models that it's a certain condition on the on the generating uh, function xi that defines the covariance but i don't exactly remember which uh, what are the conditions there yeah does this answer your question yeah I, I was just trying to understand i mean this is this uh it's subsequently converging because these are bounded uh, bounded quantities i'm just trying to understand which cases the convergence as n goes to infinity is Understood that I, I, you said there are some technical conditions under which this is known. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And uh, yeah, so yeah, of course these are bounded, so you have subsequential convergence anyway. But you can show that the whole sequence converges to this thing that is gamma, that is the minimizer, under certain conditions. Yeah. Thanks. So there is. Uh, so for the algorithm, for the sake of this algorithm, we're gonna. Uh, exploits this, uh, this celebrated structure that is called the ultrametric structure that, that, is, that organizes uh, the, the, the optima or the approximate global optima of this Hamiltonian. And this has been discovered by physicists and has been uh, progressively better understood by mathematicians. So here we have um, a tree, so you can picture a tree that has a roots and then branches infinitely often. And this picture is as follows. So this is related to our problem in the following sense in that the clusters of near optima in the hypercube are represented by the leaves of this, in, of this infinitary tree. So you have the leaves of this tree represent the clusters of near optima and uh, the ancestral nodes in this tree, which are nodes that are at level, at this level, for, sorry, at this level, for instance, those are uh, associated to points M that are inside the solid cube and at level T. So we're here, we're uh, indexing this tree by an interval from zero to one. And at level T of that tree, the norm of the points that is inside the cube that is at that level has norm T when properly normalized, okay? And now the Euclidean distance between clusters, if you take to look at this cluster and this cluster, by the way, do you guys see my cursor, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you take uh, the inner products or the distance between this this point and this point, then their inner products or their distance is re reflected by the tree uh, distance in this tree. So you have to go up here and then come back to get to understand the distance. So they're organized in a uh, in a in an ultrametric way in a tree like structure. Hey, I, Ahmed. Quick question. So. Yeah. Um, I only know the physics version of this. So is the, is the reason why these states, these nodes are associated with points in the interior of the cube? Are those, are the coordinates, the marginals of uh, a given of each spin within that cluster? Right, so yeah, there is a, there is a more refined description, which is to say that actually these are clusters that are, okay, so the clusters are, uh, they have this hierarchical clustering uh, uh, structure to them. And the point M is the barycenter of the corresponding cluster at that level. 
right? So M is just the magnetization or is the, the mean of, the, of that cluster, right? So that's, that's uh, what you say. When you say marginals, that's what, me, what, what marginal means in this case. So, right, so this uh, structure has been, uh, has been discovered and indeed studied to extensive detail in this uh, seminal paper from 1985. It's called the, the, the Microstructure of Ultrametricity by Mezal and Viazol. And in that paper, they say the following. They say that the ultrametric topology of the space of equilibrium stays of a spin glass deserves special attention. Such an organization might, might exist in other systems with frustration and disorder. And it should have consequences in such fields of optimization problems and neural networks. So, so far, so after the publication of that paper, it hasn't been uh, very much elucidated. This disconnection that has been foreseen in this paper hasn't been elucidated. And this has been now, uh, exploited in the last past couple of years by uh, people like uh, Subag and uh, Andrea, and then uh, with our paper that follows up on them. So here, the main algorithmic idea is to start at the root of this tree and to construct a random path that just travels and explores this tree up to a certain point where it hits a leaf, and hopefully that leaf will be the optimum. So that's the main algorithmic idea. So the geometric picture, the, the associated geometric picture here is to start at the origin of Rn, and to grow a certain path, a random path that travels in the cube, inside the cube, and hopefully at the terminal time, it'll hit the corner of the cube. So we'll have to steer this, uh, this, this trajectory in the right way. So it will, this will come up to be an, uh, a stochastic control problem that, that I'll talk about later. Okay, so the main result here is that there exists an algorithm that outputs a sigma that is in the cube after C of epsilon iterations. So the iterations is the number of conversations with the oracle, the number of gradient evaluations. So that's such that you get one minus epsilon times an in, the infimum of P, which is supposed to describe the maximum of the Hamiltonian. But here we're optimizing over a slightly larger class of functions that is that I call L. And this class of functions contain non-monotone functions. So it's not so U only contain non-decreasing functions, but L can contain uh, functions that are decreasing and then increasing. And it turns out this L, if you intersect L with the set of non-decreasing functions, you get U. So that's, uh, that's the relationship between U and L. And uh, so of course, if this minimizer is achieved at a non-decreasing function, then, then you've, you've reached the goal, right? So the, pro the, the algorithm is optimal. So it reaches one minus epsilon times the optimum if the infimum is achieved at a non-decreasing function. That's just an obvious, uh, uh, observation here. And so the fact that uh, the property that that infimum is strictly increasing is what we call the no overlap gap condition or phys physicists call it full or continuous replica symmetry breaking. So that's by definition, we take as a definition of an overlap gap, the property that this infimum is optimized at a function that is strictly increasing. Does this make sense? Yeah, Ahmed, I remember from Andrea's paper that, you know, he kind of assured us that the physicists believe the no overlap gap properly, uh, property. So, I mean, is this a more generalized version, but also like strongly believed? No. So, uh, right. So it depends on the model that you're considering. For the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, it is indeed believed that there is no overlap gap. But for other models, for instance, just the three spin model, when you consider in polynomial of degree three, there is an overlap gap. At least it is believed that there is an overlap gap. And uh, we'll show that this indeed so the algorithm will not be able to achieve the optimum. It will just achieve this value, but not more. I Actually, see. in uh, p equal to four, there is a provable overlap gap. P for p equals four, uh, I'm not aware of that. For the for the the, the hypercube case for the the for the, the hyper. For the hyper I see. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah, thank you. So who proved yeah. that? Waco Waco Chen showed that. We have a paper. Waco Chen worked out the computation section. I see, interesting. I would like to see it as but I did not know that, thanks. Um, right. Okay, so not only does this algorithm achieves this value, but also this, is, this value is the best possible achievable by a class of what we call IMP algorithms. So this, is the, this hints at an algorithmic threshold for optimization in spig masses. This, so we consider this class of algorithms that we can, it's a, there, there are many degrees of freedom in this class, and the best value that is achieved in this class is given by this number. 
I, I'm sorry. Can you just this went by too quickly for me? What is uh, you, you was the set of sorry. What is L now? <laughs> yeah. So this you went by very fast. Right. So sorry. Yeah. So the infimum over of P over the class U is what describes the ground state energy is the, the maximum. Right. And, and you're saying that it's an infimum over a larger class L, which is therefore less than or equal to, and that this, these are different, then you have a gap, but can you remind me what L, the set L is again? So that I didn't define this properly. I didn't, I don't have any uh, formula for the set L on my slides, but I just say that it contains, so U is, uh, it is defined primarily by the property that it, the functions that, that it contains are non-decreasing. But, Okay, perhaps Ahmed, you can say L is just functions that have bounded total variation in any subinterval of zero one. So basically, it's any function that is not too too wild, too crazy. Yeah. And so the line of this slide, what you mean is that L contains non-monotone functions. Yeah. Not so that, L. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not that its subset U does. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And this is the kind of the, like whether this uh, gap exists or not is something that you can kind of try to test with the computer. Uh, like so is that that's, the basis of uh, some of the, the beliefs about it? Right. So that's the, my next slides. Let's see. Okay. So let's test this in a computer. Um, you can solve this for SK. So for the two spin model, you can minimize this Parisi formula. And this is the gamma that, that minimizes the Parisi formula. Okay. So it's strictly increasing, at least according to my discretization. And uh, so you see that there is an overlap gap. So we I do actually believe that there is an overlap gap. And in this case, so the optimal value is the, is the one that is achieved by our algorithm, which is given by this number. So for the three spin model, so this is very different. So if you solve the problem over U, which is the set of functions that are non-decreasing, there is a plateau and then the function diverges. And the uh, ground state energy is given by this number that is 0.81. On the other hand, if you solve the extended variational principle over this larger class L, there is, uh, so we see that gamma will look like this, more or less. So gamma will be decreasing and then increasing. And this is very far from being not decreasing, of course. And the, that, therefore, the algorithmic value is strictly smaller than 0.81. It's about 0.8, 0, 0. OK? So the, there is a gap. And moreover, so I want to compare this also to the threshold energy, which is the value that is believed to be achieved by Glauber dynamics, at least over polynomially many steps or constantly many steps. And that value has been evaluated based on physics grounds uh, in a paper by Tommaso Rizzo. And that value is about 0.78. So it's strictly smaller than the value that is achieved by our algorithm. So which means that this algorithm is actually better than doing Glauber dynamics. Okay, so by let me way, tell you. By, by the yeah. way, Ahmed, is the graph on the left just the tail of the graph on the right? Uh, the graph on the left is the tail of the graph on the It looks no. like if you're. Yeah, uh, I mean, they look quali qualitatively, they look the same, at least on the um, close to one, but uh, I wouldn't be able to say that they're actually equal. So I guess, like, one point is that, like, the graph on the right is not like the CDF of any random variable. Exactly. Yeah, but, okay. That's the point. Yeah. It's so, yeah. So, um, yeah. So the graph on the left, it, it's the CDF of a probability distribution, which is okay. So, but the, so it corresponds to a probability measure, but the graph on the right is just a signed measure. It's not a probability measure. So let me tell you about this algorithm. So this is a general class of algorithms that are called AMP. And um, right. So the general iteration is as follows. So you initialize it. So there are two main iterates that I call M and Z. So these are the main, the main objects. And you initialize them in a certain way, then you consider a class of functions, a sequence of functions FL that take the first L iterates. So you have a sequence of functions that you can choose however you want. Now, up to step L, you evaluate this, this function on the tuple Z0 up to ZL, and that gives you ML. Now you ask, you give this vector ML to your oracle, computes the gradients for you, gives you this number, this vector that is the gradients, and then subtracts a linear combination of the previous Ms to obtain the next Z. Oh, sorry. Okay. So that's the algorithm. And these numbers, these coefficients of a closed form, you can compute them. It's not a problem. So I didn't put a formula for them, but.
So there is, you can, you can characterize the behavior of this algorithm in, in, in a vast generality. So it doesn't matter what these functions are, as long as they're Lipschitz and they're weakly differentiable, that's, that's fine. So you can characterize uh, the sequence of iterates Z0 up to ZL for any fixed L. And this will converge, this two tuple will converge to a certain centered Gaussian process with a covariance that is given by this, so the, that's, this tuple will converge to random variables that are Z here. So these are, these are scalars, these are vectors. So what I mean by convergence here is that the empirical distributions of the entries will converge to a, to a, to a random variable that is real valued. And the stochastic process that they converge to is a Gaussian vector that is centered and has a covariance that is defined recursively by this formula. Okay. So just as an example, if you consider the quadratic case where we just have a quadratic here, um, then the gradients is just a G. So we're just multiplying G by M here instead of the gradients. And C prime is uh, the identity or C prime of X is X, in which case uh, we have this relationship in the covariance. Okay. So I'm gonna just sorry, I just wanna make sure that I'm oriented properly. So I should think of F as not depending on G. F is a sequence of functions that are deterministic. Okay. Yeah. So the randomness comes from disease, not there's nothing there is nothing G related here to, to from this the initialization choice of, F. of disease. And what's what's that? From the initialization of disease of disease. Yeah, so the initialization will be chosen in a certain way that, that I explained, but that's also independent of G. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, so if we wanted to do simple gradient descent, then ML would be equal to ZL, is that right? Or Yeah, so right. I, I, so so, so this, this looks like it includes standard gradient descent, but it also includes fancy things that have momentum terms and things like that. Yeah, fair enough, yes. Uh, that's one way to see it, right? So here I'm, so, for gradient descent, you would remove or power iteration, for instance, you would remove this term that, or the last term, the reaction term, and then M would be Z, right? But here, uh, you don't have to do that. So this is a more general iteration. Um, so here, okay, so for quadratics, for quadratics, you can write down, so these, these coefficients, okay, so one, spe one special case is, um, when f, the function f doesn't depend on the whole tuple, it depends only on the last point zl, in which case the, the, this, this iteration simplifies and then the reaction term, this term that I subtract reduces to only one, one, one term instead of having l terms. And uh, so it looks like this. So this is perhaps more, more, uh, more familiar, you're perhaps more familiar with the usual AMP iteration, which is this one. Um, Right, so if you can write it in coordinates, this is what it looks like. Um, so I was planning to explain um, the, the, the role of, this, of this, uh, this, uh, this term, this reaction term here. And basically the idea is the role of this memory term is to replace G at any iteration, every iteration to replace G, to act as if G was replaced by a new copy at every iteration. So basically suppose now that this term doesn't exist but at every iteration of the algorithm, I get a new G that is independent of everything else. So suppose that that's the case, then if I compute the inner products between ZL plus one and ZJ plus one, so for L different from J possibly. So since this is a new iteration, I get a new G that is independent from M on both sides here and here, right? So now I can, by concentration of measure over G, which is independent of everything else, this is reduces to the inner products between ML and MJ, right? So what the algorithm does, so of course the algorithm does not have access to new randomness at every iteration. It has to use the same matrix over and over again, which creates a dependence between M and G. So this argument is no longer valid. I cannot, I cannot use this, 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 uh, this argument to argue that the inner products between disease is the same as the inner products between the ends. But the reaction term here, this, this memory term acts as if, so it restores this property. So it basically removes all the dependencies in order to still make this thing work, 
this relationship work, and that's exactly the content of state evolution, which means that, okay, so the inner product between the Zs is the same as the inner product between the Ms, and recall that M is just F, FL of this, this, this tuple. So this is a very high level of uh, explanation of the presence of this memory term. Um, perhaps I should just uh, not talk about the heuristic here, uh, about the derivation of this memory term. So when, this is not a difficult one that you can do, but uh, okay. So there is a rigorous uh, proof of this state evolution that it has been uh, uh, considered or invented by Bolthausen, by Erwin Bolthausen, that is called Gaussian condition. And this relies on the, on the, the assumption that the Gs are the interaction terms, the interaction coefficients are Gaussian. And uh, so this, this is a certain proof that is very dependent on the Gaussian nature of the interactions but you would expect universality in this case. So, so here AMP shouldn't really depend or the behavior of AMP shouldn't really depend on whether the interactions are Gaussian or have another distribution, as long as they're IID, you have finite moments, et cetera. And uh, so you would want to extend the proof of state evolution or the correctness of state evolution to non-Gaussian matrices. And indeed that's, this is what it's, what's called universality. And this has been proved by Bayati, Montanari and Lelage for a certain class, restricted class of functions, FL. And those are uh, polynomials, to be more precise. They prove this for polynomial, for pro polynomial nonlinearities. And recently, in a very nice, beautiful work by Chen and Lam, they extended this to, to all Lipschitz functions. So your FLs can be any Lipschitz function, and you'll still have universality. OK, so let's go back to optimization. So now I introduced this whole uh, class of algorithms. And you can tune the FLs however you want in order to get an algorithm. So how do we choose these nonlinearities? So there is this idea of orthogonal updates that we are, we're gonna we're gonna use here. So so optimizing over the class of FLs is somewhat intractable. It's too large of a class to optimize over explicitly. But so we're gonna use an idea here uh, that introduces the following constraints. So this is due to Eliran Zubak, and the idea here is to choose the functions f in order for the increments in the M's, so ML plus one minus ML, to be orthogonal in the past to the past iterates. Okay, so this is the new ingredients that I'm introducing. So state evolution will, will imply since, since I have the G, the, the, the Z's have the same covariance as the M's, this will imply that also the Z's have this uh, property of orthogonal updates, right? But these are Gaussians. So we have a Gaussian, a sequence of Gaussian vectors which are centered and they have orthogonal increments. So we can in particular choose to make them be Brownian motion. Okay, so this is of course sample at discrete times, Brownian motion that is sampled at the discrete, time, discrete times of the iteration of the algorithm. Okay, so now once uh, we want these to be Brownian motions, and I'll just initialize them by consistency. I'll just in initialize the first iterates to be Gaussian also with a certain covariance, with a certain variance. Now my M, I'm gonna put the first the, this ansatz that my M will look, will take this form. So it depends on the difference in the increments or the increments in Z times a function UG or UJ that only depends on the, the first J iterates. Of the, of, the, of the sequence Z. So it looks like a martingale here. So we have a bunch of terms that are, that are, that are uh, orthogonal. And now I'm reducing the choice of this nonlinearity is F to the choice of this nonlinearity is UJ. So this is a choice that I made, okay? Now it turns out that I can analyze the, I can analyze the, the behavior of this algorithm. I can analyze the, the energy that is achieved or the value that is achieved by this algorithm. Okay, um, so basically there is a constraint on these functions uj uh, that arises from, from the algorithm. So I cannot have any uj I want. There is a constraint that I have to implement. And basically that constraint is that the second moment of uj has to be one for all j. So that comes from the Brownian nature of the, of the, or the orthogonal uh, uh, increments uh, 
constraints of, of the algorithm. So basically, if you assume that the algorithm produces a Brownian motion up to time t, and you want to show that it produces still a Brownian motion up to t, time t plus one, you have to verify the conditions of the Brownian motion, which is the independent increments, and that each increment has variance that is delta. And that will imply necessarily that this, this condition has to hold. OK? So now, one thing that I can do also is to try to analyze the value that is achieved by this algorithm. So m, my m is the, the hopefully the number, the, the vector that, will out, that will, I will out, output at the end of the iteration. So I'll do a certain number of iterations, and then I'll output a vector m. Hopefully, that will be close to the corner of the hypercube. And I want to analyze the value that is achieved by this algorithm. So it's still using state evolution, and this is a computation that one can do. It's not a difficult one. You can analyze uh, the limit of this, this value, and that will converge to this integral, to the expectation of this integral, where u here, u basically is, becomes a stochastic process. Instead of considering discrete time thing, you can let delta, the discretization, go to 0, and then you get a stochastic process instead of having a discrete process. OK, so the value that I achieve is this. I have a constraint, which is the second moment of u has to be 1 for all times. And I'm adding another constraint, which is really uh, just capturing the fact that I want uh, my, my iterates to converge to a corner of the cube, which is the fact that I'm in an easing case. So since my m will hopefully converge to a corner of the cube, m at time 1, or its limits in this sense, in this scaling limit, what I call capital M, at time one, you can write it like this, has to be between minus one and one. Or more precisely, it has to be uh, included in the min be minus one or one, but you can relax it to be this interval, almost surely. Are there any questions here so far? Perhaps more than a question, a, a little remark that yeah. perhaps can be useful. There is this orthogonality constraint that plays an important role. That is, the, the algorithm always moves by moving orthogonal to the current position. Right. And this is, you know, the, the fundamental inspiration to this is, uh, you know, the work of, uh, you know, physicists dating back to, you know, Paris, Mesar, et cetera, that says that this tree that you draw you know, in your slide, if you embed it in the hypercube, is such that each node. Uh, branches in a way orthogonal to the position of the node. So each node is embedded from a point to a point in the per cube ML, and the branching are uh, orthogonal to this, right? So that suggests the idea that you know was was exploited by uh, you know Eliran very nicely to you know, follow this. Right. Direction. Right. So yeah, I didn't describe the, the whole picture. But, yeah, the, the, there is a very detailed understanding of what this tree looks like and the structure, this microstructure of ultrametricity is. And this has indeed been foreseen by physicists. This idea of orthogonal updates has been foreseen by physicists. But that's what we're exploiting here. Um, all right, so let me go back here. So he, now it, this becomes an algorithmic design question, right? So I have a class of algorithms that are parametrized by these functions u. And I know for each choice of the functions u, I know what the what the energy uh, what what energy I achieve by this algorithm in this limit. Now I want to maximize this number. I want the u's that maximize this number according to these constraints, right? So this becomes a stochastic control problem. So I'm maximizing over processes u that, has, that are in a certain space that, that is nice and everything. So there are technical conditions there. The main conditions are that the second moment is always 1, and that this integral, this Brownian, this, this Etho integral, is between minus 1 and 1 at the last time, at time 1. Okay. So now I can, I can try to analyze this and try to get what is the value E star here. I can try to analyze this. Okay, so this is the main, the main, the main, the main problem. This is you see, this is a linear function in U. This is a non-convex function. This is a non-convex constraint. This is also more or less a convex constraint. This is the pro problematic constraint. So I'll try to relax it. Okay, so let's try to relax it. So I'll try to put that constraint in the objective function. I'll just multiply it by Lagrangian multiplier. 
this Lagrangian multiplier call it new here. So I'm just putting the constraints. This is the, the usual thing you would do with a convex optimization or a non-convex optimization problem. When you relax it, you put the constraints in the objective function and you multiply it by a, by a multiplier. And that multiplier, I wrote it here in a very convenient way in terms of this function gamma that is, that is, uh, that it, it is related. The name gamma is not you know, fortuitous. It is related to the Parisi formula in a second. So this becomes a convex problem uh, that I can try to study, that I can try to analyze. And just a remark is that since this is a relaxation, I have that my E star is always smaller, not no larger than the value of this relaxation for any gamma, for any choice of gamma. Okay. Now the theorem is that that's, this relaxation is the Parisi functional. So this is one of the main theorems here. So the Parisi functional that I showed you in a, maybe 10 slides ago, that can be written in terms of a functional over a solution of a, a nonlinear PDE, it can be equivalently written as this stochastic control problem. Okay, second, this inequality can turn into equality if you optimize. So this is this. So you have an inequality. So in particular, you can put an infimum here over a large enough class of functions. And if this function, this class of functions is large enough, this inequality becomes tight. So you can you can you can saturate this integral this uh, duality gap by cho choosing the class of functions over which you're optimizing to be large enough, right? And this is what this is. So it turns out that this class of function is what I call script L. And that script L doesn't have to be restricted to the class of increasing or non-decreasing functions. It can be any function that is nice enough, that is not too crazy. Okay, so I'm saturating this duality gap by optimizing, optimizing over a function of a class of functions that is large enough. So now we're done, right? So I have a value that is the value that is achieved by my algorithm or the best value that could be achievable in my class of algorithms that I call E star to be equal to the Parisi formula, albeit uh, this, the, 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 the space over which I'm optimizing is slightly larger. Are there any questions? Okay, so maybe I can tell you a little bit about the proof, but um, this, this, uh, this will be a very high level. So let me tell you about the proof that this relaxation is the Parisi formula. So this is a stochastic control problem, and this is the Parisi, for, the Parisi functional that has been defined using the nonlinear PDE. So I will consider this function that I call V. Um, and this function has been cooked up in a certain way. So it depends on two parameters, time and uh, a, position, a position variable that I call Z. And um, this is almost the same thing as in the definition of this relaxation, except that I'm only starting the integral at time t instead of time zero. And I am, so in all of these integrals, I'm starting at time t. And here in the constraint, I'm adding this number Z in the constraints, okay? So this is another stochastic control problem that it has these two variables, t and z. So obviously if you put t to be zero and z to be zero, this is just the definition of the relaxation. And hopefully now by looking at this function and its behavior for all t and z, hopefully we can understand its value at zero, zero. So you can try to do dynamic programming. So this is, you open a book on stochastic control and this is the first thing that one do one does in this in this situation, you can try to do dynamic programming, and then try to write a PDE or that is satisfied by the by by this function v. Okay, so let me skip the details. You can get this thing that is called the hamilton jacobi bellman equation, that is that that uh, basically rules the behavior of this function v. And this is another PDE that is not linear. It's a, it's a, it's a it's a complicated PDE, and it looks like this. Now. Hopefully, the, that PDE will turn into the Parisi PDE under some change of variables. So that was our hope. So let's do this change of variables. Let's consider that V be written uh, as the Lagrange transform of another function, phi. And there are a bunch of other terms that, are, that just compensates, that, that are not very important. But the, the important part is this Lagrange, uh, this Legendre transform. So if you do this change of variables, then 
V satisfying this Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation is equivalent to phi satisfying the Parisi PD. And uh, so based on that, you can basically find the relaxation. So now once you have this relation, then you can get the value of the relaxation as the value of V at zero, zero by exploiting this, that will be the Parisi, P, the, the Parisi functional. So there is a duality here between this Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation and the Parisi PD which reflects the duality between the stochastic control problem and uh, the Parisi formula. Okay, so here the main message is this duality between the stochastic control problem and the Parisi formula. So these are equal, so these are as numbers, as real numbers, these are equal. And uh, we've exploited this stochastic control formulation in an algorithmic way. So we got this stochastic control formulation uh, from the design of an algorithm for the question for the algorithmic design question of trying to trying to optimize the value of the Hamiltonian. And uh, yeah, so uh, maybe this duality is uh, is much more deep, more deep than that. Or we can try to try to understand this duality in order to say things that we don't would not know how to say about the Parisi formula. And just a small remark here is that so this to go back to this question of how did the maximum turn into an infimum, we're trying to maximize Hamiltonian. And then we end up with an expression of this, of the limiting value of this maximum to be an infimum over another functional. So how did the maximum turn into an infimum? Now we can answer that question and that, that, that's because of duality, right? So if you're trying to optimize, then hopefully, you'll get something that looks like a supremum. And that's what we did, we've done here. So if you try to do an algorithm, consider this algorithmic approach that tries to optimize, then you get a description that gives you still a supremum because you're trying to optimize, you're trying to maximize. Then the infimum ends up being just the dual of this other problem that was, that was to try to optimize, right? So this is just a duality relationship. And uh, yeah, so some inter interesting directions after this is to try to get a physical interpretation of this extended uh, variational principle. And since so this, for now, we do not understand what this extended uh, principle corresponds to in terms of properties of the landscape of the, of the random energy function. And uh, so, yeah, it would be an interesting thing to try to understand in particular this minimizer gamma that is not monotone, what's its interpretation? We do not know. So exploring this duality property and then considering other models such as beyond the P-spin model or the SK model that are perceptron, KSATs, et cetera. The question of sampling is also an interesting one. So if instead of considering optimization, you can consider the problem of, at positive temperature and uh, how can you produce a sample from the Gibbs measure at low temperature? So we do not know. And uh, another extension we need to consider sparse models instead of having fully connected graphs, you can look at models that are built on random regular graphs with say constant degree. Can you, for instance, get the value of min bisection or max cut using this type of approach? Yeah, and thank you, that's all. All right, thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, could I could I ask us to flash back to the page where the duality is is set up? I just uh, was uh, I just wanted to no no the previous one. Uh, which the the one where you're showing the primal and the dual for the first time. Uh, this one. Yeah. Or, okay, yeah. I, I guess I guess maybe I can ask a more specific question. I just wanted to see how the choice of the set capital fancy L arises um, in the duality. Yeah. Um, so that arises from the desire to uh, reduce this this uh, duality gap. So you want this duality, you want to kill this duality gap, right? So you want to optimize over the largest possible class of functions that you have. So the larger the class of functions you're optimizing over, hopefully the smaller this duality gap is, right? I think I see. Okay. So now the question is just uh, how large can this space be in order for this inequality to turn into equality? And that's how you get the space of functions L. I see, okay. So, so in the primal, there's also optimization over 
the choice of this gamma? No, so it's, this is a number. This is, does, doesn't depend on gamma or anything. This, this thing doesn't depend on gamma. The right-hand side depends on gamma. So because this is a Lagrange multiplier, right? In the primal, there is an equality constraint that is expectation of u squared equal one. Yeah. And this gamma is just Lagrange multiplier for... I see. It has to be equal to one for each time. Okay, so now you, you put a dual parameter for each time. So this is a function that can take any value at each time, right? Now, <laughs> things in continuous time, is a little bit, uh, you cannot put uncountably many you know, multipliers, so you have to choose a function space, right? Sure. But conceptually, you are putting a, a Lagrange parameter for every time, and this is your gamma. I see. Okay, thanks. Let me say, by the way, uh, we don't have any like a specific break time, uh, question time built into the schedule. Uh, I do have a bunch of questions and we can definitely stick around for questions. Uh, people need to go. I just want to point out that we have a social hour to which you have to bring your own drinks and hors d'oeuvres. Sadly, that's taking place at 2 p.m. Pacific, which is a little over an hour from now. And the website for that is in the chat. I'll also put it in the Discord. Uh, but let's get back to the questions. I'm going to give you some questions. Thanks again, Ahmed, for your talk. Uh, some questions that have appeared uh, from the audience. Yeah. Uh, the first question is from um, Jay Mardia, who asks, what does this algorithm look like for a spe simple specific example? Say the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. Is there a simple description of the updates slash iterates? Yeah, I mean, it's not more simple than this. It's just, that's just, that's how simple it is. But where is it? Um, um, did I write it somewhere? Yeah, this is the iteration. Oh, sorry, no, not that one. Uh, this is the iteration. Uh, it's not simpler than this. So for, for the quadratic case, it reduces the gradient reduces to just the multiplying M by the matrix G, right? But then the, this is as simple as it gets. Now we have to choose, uh, you have to choose the functions F in the right way. And the right way was in a couple of slides after. Um, is by exploiting this idea of orthogonal updates, right? So the the functions f that give that maps the z's to the m's are written in this way, and you have to choose these u's in the right way. So here, once you solve the stochastic control problem, so this is a point that I didn't explain. Once you solve the stochastic control problem, it tells you exactly what these functions should be. And those functions are basically the second derivatives of the Parisi formula, of the, the Parisi PDE so solution. So solve the Parisi solution, that will give you a representation of what these functions should be. Can, can I ask a related question? I, I know I'm yeah. interjecting, but so there's a really naive algorithm that says for a given point, in the interior of the cube, I calculate the I can calculate the expected energy of the uh, uh, assuming that every uh, that the spins are independent with those magnetizations or marginals, and then inside the cube I could do gradient descent, and then I could do a constrained gradient descent where at each step I only do moves in the hyperplane perpendicular to all my previous moves. Yeah. Um, that's not the algorithm you're describing, right? That's an even, that's a very naive algorithm. I'm just curious if we know how well that algorithm works. Um, so let's see. Um, so that's not the algorithm I'm considering, but it's an- it, It's in this family of algorithms. Right, so right? it I mean, looks, yeah. yeah, it looks like a good idea. So what you can do is, um, look at the iterates up to time L or time J, whatever, and then uh, consider the next iterate by computing the gradient at that point and then projecting away, projecting it away from the linear span of the previous iterates. It, exactly, yeah. So do we know anything about what that achieves? Uh, so I think that would achieve the value. So that will also get you, no? Um, I, Got a yeah, shake, a shake head sure. from Andrea. I, I don't know why I should achieve the value. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, so my yeah, the intuition here is that it's it's 
attempts to satisfy these constraints of orthogonal updates. So, okay, so it, it could be a good algorithm. I don't know how to analyze it, but yeah. Uh, yeah, several more questions. Let me take uh, them slightly out of order. We had a question from Ashwin uh, Pananjati who asked, uh, I may have missed this, actually, I don't think he did, but did we say what C of epsilon is, the number of iterations required for uh, approximate mission passing to get within one minus epsilon? Right. Um, that would be, if, roughly speaking, of order one over epsilon squared. Okay, good, succinct well, answer. Perhaps I can give a, also make a comment on Chris' question, uh, why, you know, a more naive algorithm. You know, for any algorithm in this class of AMP, you, you can choose this sequence of function in any way. This still goes more or less in the direction of the gradient and orthogonal to the previous iterates, and we can compute the value. And the point is that unless these functions you are chosen in the optimal way, that is using the stochastic optimal control, the value, I mean, we have a tight analysis of the value that you achieve, and the value is not the optimal value. Right, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, so, but so in principle, you could use this machinery to calculate the value that that naive algorithm achieves. Uh, yeah, I think in principle, modular enough yeah. work, yes. Uh, let me ask you a question from another Chris, Chris Jones, I think of Chicago. Uh, Chris asks, um, if you fix any set of unit vectors S, do you think you can use this to approximate the maximum of X transpose H X uh, over X in the set S? Did you catch it? Uh, yeah, let me try to parse this. Yes, over a set S, but what, what's the set S? It's any arbitrary set? Yeah, so unfortunately the Zoom does not allow cut and paste, but let me try to retype the question just in case. Fix any set of unit vectors S. Oh, I can actually see the chat. I can actually see the okay. chat. Use this to approx. I'll type it because yeah. it's hard for people to understand anyway if they're just listening. X transpose H X. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, I have no idea. Yeah, um, we're exploiting the structure of the cube here. It depends. If your set is weird, then I don't. I don't expect. Like, if your set is really weird, then why would anything work? I don't know. Maybe a good open question to think about during the week. Um, there's another question from uh, Siki Liu. Uh, she asks, um, question, is max cut on sparse deregular graphs full RSB? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it is believed to be so. It is believed to be the case. But so what does full RSB mean, though? Um, so the way I defined it is that I set up the Parisi formula that, is, that represents the maximum or whatever, the free energy, the limit of the free energy, let's say. And then I defined full RSB to be the property that the minimizer, this function that minimizes the Parisi functional is strictly increasing. Um, now, in the sparse case, such, such representations are not known. It is very difficult to come up with a variational principle that tells you, for instance, the number or like that characterizes the value of max cuts, for instance, in a sparse random graph. There is a recent proposal in physics, but it's extremely complicated. I don't understand it yet. Um, and then extracting information from it would be a difficult task. You can define full RSB in a different way is in terms of the structure of the landscape, in terms of how the solutions are organized. And that would still make sense to talk about full RSB in max cut or in sparse random graphs, even though we don't understand the Parisi formula. And it is believed that in this case, according to this definition of full RSB, Yes, it is believed that the problem is full RSB. Uh, uh, go ahead. Good comment, but on the hypergraphs, it's probably non RSB. It, if I understood uh, non full RSB, if I understood correctly per your definition, in the sense of discontinuous support, no uh, yeah. overlap gap. Yeah. So so right. So hypergraphs. When I say you say hypergraphs, I think three spin, or I think you know. It's, yeah, P spin, right? So max cut is more related to SK, closer to SK than it is related to, uh, yeah. Of course, yeah. Maybe so I'll so the, go ahead. The high, the high level, the high level take home message here is that problems with full replica symmetry breaking are easy to find near ground states. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, the, you're, I mean, since full RSB meant that that function 
that the optimum was achieved by a non-decreasing function. And the converse of that was that there's an overlap gap, which we associate with hardness. You're basically saying that full RSB equals easy. Uh, yeah, modulo being able to find an algorithm, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. Uh, I have a question. Maybe I'll actually get at Chris Moore's uh, earlier question. Uh, so for Sherrington Kirkpatrick, uh, you can code this? Did somebody code it and run it? Yeah, we did. Um, Andrea, when is the paper going to show up? <laughs> Any day. <laughs> <laughs> Any yeah. day. Yeah, so we coded this. Yeah, yeah, we coded this. Um, so there are difficulties in the discretization. Yeah, okay. So it's a it's a whole work uh, to try to code this up, mm -hmm. and uh, you do get uh, consistent values, experimental values that are very consistent with the theory. So that will show up maybe in a couple of days. I see. And maybe uh, are you able in a future work to try Chris's algorithm too? I mean, uh, you can compare yeah, them. We can compare them. I don't think that's too difficult to code. Yeah, that one should be, we would be able to code that, yeah. Uh, Mine is much easier to code. Right, yeah. And is the, uh, is the running time, like, I mean, is the a big factor in the running time the one over epsilon squared? Not really. Um, not really? Not really. You can, yeah, for, for maybe n equals 1,000 to 8,000, that you can, you can run the algorithm in that, like less than a minute, it's, it's, it's fine. So, cool. Sam, you have a question. Do you want to just ask it uh, vocally? Sure, yeah. Um, along a slightly different line, how much robustness could you expect from, from these algorithms in particular and also from maybe any algorithm achieving similar guarantees if there are roadblocks to it? So by robustness, I mean um, if, I get, if I allow an adversary to modify my input in some way, modify the, the, the Hamiltonian I'm working with, or maybe equivalently, I give you a sample from some distribution, which is only approximately, uh, you know, a, a GUI matrix, um, you know, it's close and watched in some distance, but not exactly the correct distribution to, to, to be sampled from. Yeah, I mean, as, as long as, as, long as um, you have your universality, the distribution is not the one that we considered here, but it still produces the same predictions, then I would guess you can still use the algorithm. But I guess robustness here, there's an adversary that tries to correct, that tries to screw you, yeah, right? So it tries to like get you to, uh, your algorithm to fail. And I would guess this algorithm is brittle to that. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it doesn't, I don't, I don't expect this algorithm to be very, very robust to this kind of things. I, I think due to, what? due to, uh, oh, sorry. One, one, one simple robustness is that if you do a perturbation that is small, in operator norm, say in operator norm is more than epsilon, then uh, everything gets, you know, it's continuous, gets perturbed by epsilon. But beyond that, if you do a large operator norm perturbation, I expect it to become fragile. Sorry, so if you if you do an operator norm perturbation, the, the this algorithm, uh, the value doesn't change easily, and uh, this algorithm also shouldn't change. Okay, cool. Because it, it's Sorry. everything. I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> but I have my phone here. <laughs> Can I chime in for a second here? But but there is a there is a chaos. Uh, onset of chaos happens pretty quickly, right? So if you perturb just a small fraction of entries, you in distribution will achieve the same value, but there will be an opt nearly optimal solution of a com essentially completely different model. Right. But one thing to pay attention here is that the algorithm is not, okay, why, why there is a completely different solution? Because there is a solution that is, there are near optimal, there are, you know, delta times n above the global optimum, and they are nearly orthogonal to the global optimum, okay? But here we are solving, uh, we don't care about this delta times n uh, thing, right? Even if we find one of these, we are happy. You just it's want to find one. I mean, we are, in fact, we don't claim that ever that we find, and I think it's a good question whether we can find, you know, approximation with epsilon scaling like, you know, n to the minus say inverse polynomially. Uh, what is the inverse polynomial? Can we find, uh, you know, near optimum within an error that is n to the minus, you know, one third? I thought, That's I thought no. you said the running time was was poly one over epsilon, so that. What's the obstacle to doing that? Yeah, but that is for every uh -huh. fixed, for every fixed epsilon as n goes to infinity. All right. So the the 
order of limits is important here. But that's that's important for the analysis that you're able to give. But there's it like, is it believable that the same algorithm would, you know, run for longer would produce uh, inverse polynomially good approximation? I don't know. Um, so you can ask whether you can get an exact uh, optimum, and uh, we don't believe that that's actually possible in polynomial time. So that's the extreme version of your question. Yeah, and exact, exactly because of David argument, right? If you want to uh, find a very precise optimum, then you really need to be careful about checking every entry of your matrix to within 30 <laughs> digits, decimal digits, right? Yeah. I, I yeah. cannot think of such an algorithm, but perhaps you can. So one, <laughs> one, one related question here um, is, uh, can you produce not only one optimum or one op approximate optimizer, but many? Can the same algorithm give you many approximate optimizer to the same, which, which have any inner products you want? Mm -hmm. So that you can modify this algorithm to get you that. So if you want sigma one and sigma two to be approximate optimizers and sigma one times sigma two to be 0.5, you can still do that with this algorithm or a modification of this algorithm. So that will describe this tree. So you're just branching out in the tree, then you can bifurcate at any point you want and get two trajectories that go to two independent, or not independent, but two approximate global optima. And they have the inner product that you want them to have, which is the point at which you bifurcated in the tree. So actually we have two related questions, uh, one from Siddhant and Wave and one from Ronan. Uh, I'll just read both of them, it's okay, uh, Siddhant, because they're kind of similar. So Siddhant's question was, depending on the random initialization, you get a quote, random output. Is there any reason to believe the random output's distribution looks like a low temperature Gibbs distribution? And Ronan uh, asks a related question, can you say something about how the energy of the point the algorithm reaches is distributed? on a scale that sees the difference between one minus epsilon and one, could it be the case that the algorithm actually samples from the Gibbs measure for some temperature, which is slightly below the critical temperature? Let me try to absorb these questions. Um, so the first question is, uh, does, it, does the, the output looks like a sample from the Gibbs measure at some, some temperature? So the epsilon right. is, is playing that role, is playing the role of beta. Because so you're only trying, so for any fixed epsilon, you're trying to get to a level set. And uh, you can see that the, 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 the output of your algorithm is distributed according to some non-trivial. We don't know the distribution exactly of the points at, in that level set, but you can see roughly that there is a correspondence between epsilon and beta there. Uh, the second question was, what is the distribution of the energy that is achieved? Is that right? Uh, I think so. Let me... Tell it back. By the way, does that answer your question, Sidant? Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Yeah, Ronan's question was, can you say something about how the energy of the point the algorithm reaches is distributed on a scale that sees the difference between one minus epsilon and epsilon? Could it be the case that the algorithm actually samples from the Gibbs measure for some temperature, which is slightly below the critical temperature? So the distribution of the energy, let's see. No, I don't have a... I mean, I can tell you the limits. I mean, at scale one, it converged to this number that is uh, that is given by the stochastic control problem. Uh, but I don't have I don't have any control over the fluctuations at finite n. Is that what you're asking? So I mean, at scale one, yes, it converges to a delta point, which is the number that is given by the stochastic control problem. But for finite n, I don't have fluctuation results. I don't know how the things fluctuate and stuff like that. If anything, it wouldn't yeah. be slightly below the critical temperature, it's probably going to be pretty close to the very temperature close to inverse temperature close to infinity, right? Because you're right. near the ground state. By the way, I loved Ronan. Right. If you're on the call, you can talk now, apparently. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I thought, you know, maybe something happens and you it's actually an, a more accurate sample from a Gibbs measure for some su suitably chosen temperature. Um, I don't know. So we don't understand. We don't really understand sampling. Actually, I don't understand sampling and how can you turn this algorithm into a sampling procedure. But uh, maybe, I don't know, Andrea, if you have something to say. Well, I, I have uh, just a comment. Okay. First of all, as, as uh, David mentioned, this at most is a sample from, you know, very low temperature, right? Uh, not 
close to the critical temperature because a sample close to a critical temperature has much, much higher energy, much, much smaller Hamiltonian, right? Uh, you know, it's not to epsilon, epsilon would That's be a constant. Enough. And then, you know, so there is a sense in which I think the samples or something, you can generalize this algorithm, I think, at finite temperature in a sense. And there is a sense in which this looks like the Gibbs measure, but is a very weak sense in the sense that all quantities that concentrates in the, of the Gibbs measure that concentrates are reproduced by the algorithm. This is my conjecture, but not the quantities that do not concentrate. Yeah. In particular, yeah, I see. if you run two copies of the algorithm, I think that the scalar product between these two copies will concentrate. While if you sample two copies from the Gibbs measure, the scalar product, the distribution of the scalar product doesn't concentrate. So um, that, that is, is my conjecture, is, but but okay. <laughs> Here I'm just talking because we are between friends. Is, <laughs> is the intuition correct? I mean, I'm just trying to understand uh, that like you, the tree is like, branching at uh, like infinitely many different times, like uh, co like continuously, but every time it, it branches, it only branches to like a distribution with finite entropy. Like you almost have like, a f like the Gibbs measure for low temperature is concentrated on like a, f a finite number of choices. And what the algorithm does is it like kind of chooses from a subset of this that you don't really know how to characterize. But like, it could be that there is some branch that it can't choose at all, but like you still get the same concentration for all the quantities. Is that a correct intuition? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I understand. My intuition is that it's, it's you know, not, not choosing necessarily this each time there is a finite number of branches that you should take is not taking necessarily those very good ones it's taking something that is slightly worse so in the end it ends up on a much larger right like not not much much worse but like yeah. worse enough so that you you have this epsilon yeah and my, my sense is that it's very difficult to avoid that because of the chaos right? basically right because mm -hmm. Imagine one other way of looking at it is replace your uh, Gibbs measure by the average of Gibbs measure where I add, uh, you know, epsilon noise to each the coupling, where epsilon is some n to the minus zero point zero one. Uh, then uh, mm -hmm. you know I think that uh, that uh, you know this new Gibbs measure, this smoothed Gibbs measure. Uh, it's very difficult algorithmically to distinguish from the original Gibbs measure. And uh, yeah, but yeah, if you sample from this smoothed Gibbs measure, you only catch some of the properties of the original. Okay, thanks. If I'm already unmuted, can I ask another small question? Go Sorry, ahead. Ryan, thanks. Yeah, of course, go ahead, uh, we're so, just chilling out here. So, so, so <laughs> you, the choice, the optimal choice of U sub T is does it only depend on the martingale capital mt at the same point in time and on the energy you reached like the integral between 0 and t of us ds yeah so it uh, it it depends on the on the final time of another process that is not m that is not the that is not the martingale it does depend on the at time t, it depends only on this thing that is xt. So, and, and xt is another process that is defined by an SDE. So it's not really m, it's uh, something else that is defined by an SDE and only depends on the, depends on the final time of that. SDE. So, like, so, so there is a way to see this choice as like Markov. It doesn't yeah. depend like on the past if you do the right transformation. Exactly. But yeah. this, this doesn't give rise to a, an algorithm like on the level of AMP, which is also Markov, that like you 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 only do the step in a way that depends on the on on little m, little z. No, it does. Like it does. So at the level, so not only this is Markov in the limits, but it's also Markov in the at the level of the algorithm at finite end. So I wrote it this way, but you can write it in a more restrictive way instead of writing that's you. J depends on the entire sequence of the of the Z's. I can define another auxiliary sequence that I can call X, 
And that X is basically the discretization of the SDE that I talked about that I didn't write. And U will depend only on the final time. So UJ will depend only on XJ. So it is also Markov at the level of the algorithm. But you have to add this extra vector. Yeah, you have to add an extra auxiliary variable to the mix, but I didn't do that just for the sake of presentation. Right, okay. Yeah, and uh, by the way, you can see that that's how we presented in the paper. So this is, uh, if you look at the paper, that's exactly the way we presented. Thanks. There's one more question uh, from uh, Federico Ricci. Let me just see if I can make it so that he can talk. Uh, yeah, can you, Federico, can you speak? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I, can, I cannot hear you. Hmm. He can hear you, Federico. That's a funny mystery that he... I'm sorry, but I cannot hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, maybe since okay. we can talk at... Go ahead. I cannot hear you. Hmm. Yes, if you mute me in some way, I don't know. <laughs> you should be able to. I mean, I don't know what the. I don't know what to do here. Can you hear me? We can hear yes. you. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Do you hear me? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you still hear you, yeah. Ah, okay. I don't hear you. I, okay. You should just so like, take a shot speak, and ask uh, his question. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, it was just a comment, uh, maybe to answer the 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 Chris question about uh, how difficult it is to find the the ground state of the SK model. Uh, if you run similar annealing, standard similar annealing, for long enough time. Uh, you can reach in the large and limit uh, a number which is very close to the to the optimal value. So uh, even a very simple algorithm can go very close to the to the optimal value. Uh, Ten to the minus four to the to the optimal value. This can be also a partial answer on how difficult it is to sample close to the to the ground state. Similar so annealing for long enough times. Uh, we expect to sample from the Gibbs measure. So uh, maybe uh, we can sample with that, uh, but uh, this is just numeric result. So no, uh, no proof of uh, any algorithmic uh, uh, threshold. I will try to reactivate my audio, otherwise I cannot hear you anymore. So I, I just a, a clarifying, sorry, I see Andrea has a response. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on the fact that, yeah, <coughs> that kneeling probably gets to, you know, I mean, this is why we started working, gets to the, in very close to the ground state. I don't think it samples from the Gibbs measure in polynomial time for the same chaos reason that, that you were mentioning before. So in particular, if you do simulated annealing uh, to Federico and compute the P of Q, the distribution of the overlap, try to compute it. I think that that becomes very difficult at low temperature. So uh, just to clarify, and I guess, you know, this, I, I'm, I'm using this to, uh, as a preview of the social error, but, uh, um, but with more math. I mean, not all algorithms in this family that you're talking about have this property, but the orthogonal update, it cannot take more than n steps, right? We're living in a in a in a world of of uh, yeah. <laughs> dimension n. Right. So my other question is just have has this orthogonal update idea found its way to the people who work empirically on neural networks and things like that? Does it uh, has anyone found experimentally that it accelerates things in 
in other less principled areas? <laughs> um, not to my knowledge. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, maybe, uh, so Lenka works on neural networks. Maybe she, she can tell us something about this. But so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think uh, it's fine. It's fine to work on neural networks as long as you can find useful applications to spin glass theory. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea. I do not know. Yeah. We sure hope it will. <laughs> right. OK, thank you, everybody. I think that's a good time to stop. I guess we can just, uh, well, we'll trust Simons to end this uh, technological call. Yeah, we can. Everybody can applaud for each other. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you tomorrow. It starts at 9.15 Pacific. And uh, in 43 minutes or something, we can all uh, gather on gather.town. Uh, okay, yeah. see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan.